who have just joined us. That was Evelyn Simpson Curentin's My Soul Hath Found Refuge in the performed in 2019 by the Aeolians of Oakwood University. And the conductor was Jason Max Ferdinand, who's now the director of choral activities at University of Maryland College Park. Um, that piece was actually how I first found Ms. Curentin's music. I heard it at a, uh, a conference that the Aeolians performed at, and it was utterly jaw-dropping. Uh, both the performance and the, and the piece. So welcome. This is our Meet the Composer session um, with Thomas Circle Singers. And we are delighted to have our guest as our guest, Evelyn Simpson Carrington. Um, so for some context, Thomas Circle Singers and Whitman College of Walla Walla, Washington jointly commissioned a work for choir and piano by Evelyn Simpson Carrington. The result was Bill D. The Walls, a seven minute piece with text by the composer exhorting us to rebuild the foundations of our communities that have been eroded through isolation and injustice. Whitman College gave the West Coast premiere on Saturday, April 29th, under the direction of Dr. Joseph Kemper, and Thomas Circle Singers will give the East Coast premiere at our upcoming concert on Saturday, May 20th at 5 p.m. at Church of the Epiphany here in Washington, D.C. So tonight we'll hear from the composer about her creative process regarding her commission, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions at the end. For some background, Evelyn Simpson Curentin has earned many titles, including composer, arranger, pianist, organist, vocalist, artistic director, lecturer, producer, and clinician. She began playing the piano at age two and began her studies at age of, uh, the age of five. When she was nine, she was already accompanying her renowned musical family, the Singing Simpsons of Philadelphia, in public performances. She graduated from Temple University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in music education and voice. Ms. Mrs. Carrington was commissioned to complete seven arrangements for the Carnegie Hall concert featuring Kathleen Battle, Jesse Norman, and the chorus and orchestra of New York's acclaimed Metropolitan Opera. Many additional orchestras and ensembles have performed her works in the US, including the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, the National Symphony, Baltimore Symphony, Minnesota Orchestra, and the US Marine Band. We are so pleased to have you with us. Thank you so much, Ms. Carrington, and I will lead you, uh, let you take the reins. So thank you so much for being here. Well, I'm so excited to be here uh, and glad to have a chance to write for this wonderful group, um, the Thomas Circle Singers, as well as the group from uh, the Walla Walla area in the West Coast. Um, I did want to say, I guess before starting anything, the last piece that you just heard, uh, when it comes to my sense of form, it has so much to do with the flow of how the words are because sometimes I have an ABA form, sometimes I have an ABCD uh, form, which is what you heard in this last rendition. And uh, even in this piece, um, Buildy the Walls, it tends to have that kind of flow that goes how the words are inspired. So I just like to begin with uh, what a commission piece, how it comes together for me. So a commission piece for me begins with a theme in my first conversations with Miles, I needed to know, was there an underlying theme for the piece? And Miles had suggested a poem by Rainer Maria Rilke, a poem entitled, God Speaks to Each of Us. And the reason for this, he was saying that he was drawn to it. Whoops. Let me get that up here. Okay. So um, Miles suggested that poem because he said he was drawn to because it was concise yet comprehensive depiction of the human condition and our relationship with the divine. And so, of course, when I hear that kind of thing from the person who wants to commission a piece, I have to start you know, considering that in the composition. Then the second question I had was, how long was the piece to be, which I was told about five to seven minutes? The next thing of importance is to hear recordings of the choir for the colors of the voices and examples of the repertoire they are known for and how I might best use the forces of those voices. Before putting pen to paper, I pray for inspiration before commissioned pieces for God's direction as to what to say. 
because I see myself as just a conduit uh, for the creativity um, of the creator. As I peruse through the Rilke poem over some days at a time, I first thought for a, for a possible seven minute piece, I needed more lyrics because it was a little brief, um, beautiful lyrics, but it was just a little short for me for a piece that, you know, at least five to seven minutes. So I tried out a few melodic ideas, but nothing was coming to me um, that impressed me that this was a message that I could develop. So after another span of time, finally another inspiration that included the piano introduction that came to me that depicted rippling water with the text of the piece that we came up with, Build Ye the Walls. And it first started, I long for childhood days gone by, no thoughts of race or creed, where love was like a peaceful river flows. The theme of the concert my piece was to be performed on was around the massive loss of life during the pandemic and reflecting on this, um, the repertoire for this upcoming concert, which includes themes from the Civil War poetry. The Civil War, which was responsible for such loss of life over the abolishing of slavery, but yet many thought the vestiges of slavery and racism had died, but recently have found it has only morphed quietly into organizations nationwide. My lyrics address the loss of life during the pandemic and a loss of innocence in the world that could have produced such a diabolical virus that has ramifications we will feel for years to come. The lyrics of my pieces sometimes come in sections as this piece did, but the next phase, healing is the children's bread taken from Matthew 15, 26. And the musical component that came to me was a motet a cappella section, depicting this age old hard saying that Christ gave to a Canaanite woman seeking the healing for her demon possessed daughter. Because she was not an Israelite, Christ referred to her people as dogs. Well, you know, that didn't come to me when, when I was writing the piece and um, an encounter with a lovely chorister after our first reading of this piece was at Thomas Circles. We discussed this, this scripture and the chorister expounded how this woman fought with Christ and said, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And I was, you know, I was moved by that, that she went and she read um, this particular passage. And, um, and I thought about it, even as I was writing uh, these notes for today, and I was thinking, you know, with the pandemic, there's so many things that were felt about people who, you know, were not particularly important, you know, to really save them from the pandemic. And it's just saying that, you know, we are all important, no matter what, what race, what belief, any of these things, that we are all still very, very important. In light of the inequities, inequities of how many third world countries and low income people were treated during the pandemic, it becomes apparent a lack of brother and sisterhood and sheer humanity from many of our governing and healthcare leaders are in question over the massive loss of life in the rich resources and, tech, and, and technology in our nation today. With the events of the day around the world, I wrote with a sensitivity to the ever-present effect. The pandemic continued and continues to affect us with COVID-related sickness and deaths. To reemphasize the development of this piece with these thoughts in mind, the accompaniment, the accompaniment begins with a simple repetitive figure in the right hand depicting a quiet rippling river. The simplistic unison entrance of the choir represents the innocence of the years ago when things were more peaceful in the world. In my neighborhood, people greeted each other. Neighbors chatted about the day's events. Children walked alone in twos and groups without fear of abduction or shootings coming back and forth to school or massive death from a pandemic. I think I think around from childhood days, there was chicken pox and mumps and measles, but never on the form or the scale of a pandemic 
it's just unbelievable that children have to face that, possibly losing friends and loved ones during this part of their life. The lyrics express this golden age of civility, even though our world has had racism, unequal, unequal education systems globally for many years. The hymn-like structure of the harmony shows the basic cohesiveness of our world in the past 30 or more years. The text, healing is the children's bread, taken from the Bible, meaning that healing of all ills, mental, financial, social injustice, global warming, and all that is unhealthy in the world can be healed or made better. The ethereal harmonization is a prayer to God in this passage. And as I mentioned that, it, it the genre that is mentioned in that um, textually is really more from the early forms or medieval era and, and, and eras dealing with the motets, magicals, and simplistic eras of time where people would just sing before the love of it. And it could be small groups of four people, six to eight people, sometimes after meals uh, when these magicals were performed. And so you hear that a couple of times in the piece, The Healing is the Children's Bread. The feud section introduces a forceful statement in the melody and lyrics. The walls of the city are all torn down. The walls of the city are a metaphor for the multiplicity of things in the world that need restructuring. The theory is depicted in the accompaniment where the repetitive figure is seemingly unheard voices of people over our collective issues. So the, the arpeggiation that you hear in the accompaniment is very frantic and it's played forte and is to give that franticness of the people and the unrest of the people in the world at this time. And then we become, we're, say we are God's hands and feet which becomes a waltz. And I mentioned that it's like a Viennese waltz. So I'm borrowing from different eras to create these colors and these different moods uh, in the piece. And so in this section, as I said, it is like a Viennese waltz, like a dance. And there's a quartet singing first and then this antiphonal effect between the choir and the quartet. To me, the quartet symbolizes almost like an angelic beings speaking to the people of the earth. And they're just going back and forth and repeating these things. And then we become one voice after they do the antiphonal effect. So we are God's hands and feet, which is what I'm speaking of this section, meaning it's up to us to make the changes needed. The antiphonal approach to these words are the ancestors and these, and, and these also these angelic beings challenging us today to prayerfully rebuild the many walls of love, understanding, peace, justice, and integrity. But the recurring idea, build you the walls of the city, stated again with a majestic accompaniment when, when the beginning returns with a longing for a simpler way of life of days gone by and ending with a fervent prayer to God daily to bring healing to this world, humanity, environment, and every species. So when I speak of that, a very species, that's my love for humanity, climate change, all of these different things that we need to be aware of as a people, as a community, as a governing body, that we need to be aware of all of these things that affect our health, that affect the creation and what makes something like a, a I call it a diabolical disease of the pandemic to ever exist at all. So that's why the build ye the walls of the city in the peace is always sung marcato because it's, it's, it's the people singing because we're frantic that these things are, are happening in our world and the accompaniment stresses that with the marcato and, and the um, deliberate uh, way that it should be played. So that it really digs into the keys because it's representing the people and their fury over all the things that need to be righted in our world. So that's pretty much my speech. <laughs> Great, thank you. 
So there's certainly opportunity for um, for questions for Ms. Carrington, if anyone wants to ask them. Hello, Ms. Carrington. This is Wendy. Um, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that you listened to some recordings of TCS beforehand to listen to kind of the colors and the voices, and that informed your um, composition. Could you speak a little more to that about kind of what you heard and how you how you felt you could use our voices? Oh, thank you for that for that question. Um, so when I listen to a choral group, I listen to, as I say, the weight of the singers. Like say, for instance, the um, the piece that you heard in the very beginning. Um, when I first heard the group that I was writing that group for, of writing that piece for. Um, they had what I call Russian basses, you know, with these low, low, deep voices. And then um, they were singing in a rotunda. And so it gave me this effect, you know, of, okay, this Gregorian sound, that sounds like, sounds like that will work, you know, for this particular group. And so that's why you have such a span of things going on as far as range. So when I listen to the Thomas Circle singers, um, I listened to the range, I listened to the colors of the voices, which to me was, um, again, moving towards a Gregorian type of sound. And um, so I was thinking, okay, I said, I think I need to think more of a Gregorian type of color. But then I don't, you know, want to be limited in what the message is going to actually be and how the piece will actually be developed. But it just helps me to know the range and the kind of repertoire that this group handled well. And so, um, so as I listened, I said, okay. So as the piece began to come to me, I was trying to be sensitive that I stay within those colors um, that I was hearing, you know, between the soprano, well, you know, the soprano alto tenor bass and the weight of pretty much the voices in general. And then um, that helps me as I'm formulating the piece to know, okay, don't make the texture, but so heavy here, or this section will probably like, like the sopranos when I have them singing the like a Cantus Firmus line in the, um, I think it's at the end of the fugue. Let me pull that up. And they sing over the fugal material reach out to each other and it's a very um legato line that goes over all the rest of the pieces that are kind of weaving in and out build you the walls of the city so each section to me has a color that um that i need to be always conscious of you know when i'm actually beginning to formulate the piece so that's going to have a lot to do with the colors and textures that um that i'll come up with and create I hope that answered that question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. Any other questions? Um, I was wondering when you when you were writing this piece and thinking about the pandemic, was it You've spoken a lot about um, sort of like global and environmental impacts, but were, was it were you also coming it from from it from personal experience? Actually, some of it is from personal experience. I lost, um, I think it was about a year. So it was not too long after the pand pandemic began that we lost about um, it was about forty years old a nephew. Um, who only survived about seven days um, after we, um, what is it, um, getting COVID. And he's kind of a heavy set young man, but 40 years old, we just knew he was going to pull through. And um, I think I was in shock, you know, for a while because it's just, you know, even it's still surreal to me that he's gone when I see his picture. There's nothing like you having it faced it yourself. Um, then hearing the masses, you know, of deaths and whatnot, but to actually experience it's like, 
oh, no, I didn't know it would hit my family, you know, like this. And then I had another experience about, I would say it was the morning after Christmas, the next day after Christmas. Um, my sister, who lived in Seattle, who was living in Philadelphia at the time, had been texting her son, who was saying he was having difficulty breathing, and he was sorry that he had not been in touch with her. And he, um, what happened is he um, he was texting, they weren't speaking, and I, I regret that they weren't speaking so she could actually hear his voice to hear what was going on. But um, he said he was sorry because he had not been feeling well for a few weeks, and he had an adenoid um, situation. And so as a result, you know, well, his whole family had experienced COVID that year. I think it was last year sometime. But anyway, I guess he didn't realize that he was having some, some problems from COVID yet again. And within those texts, after I think my sister said, you know, well, you need to go you know, to the hospitals. He was saying he was having difficulty breathing. And within a few hours, she gets this call back that um, they were trying to revive him um, at least twice, I think it was, the second time he was gone. So it just says to me, I said, oh, my Lord. I said, here's two young men. Now, he was, I think, in his 50s, just turned 50. So that's two young, you know, young people in our family, another nephew that was just so unexpected and so quickly um, the loss of them happened. So, of course, that affected me, especially when this um, text, you know, is going to deal around the pandemic because it's a reality to me, definitely a reality to me, um, experiencing those deaths. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your question. I have two. I have two questions. Is that all right? Yes. Uh, the first question: um, the the uh, in the uh, writing stages of this, as you're making the markings. Uh, uh, notice that there were there were a lot of there were a lot of flats and in the accidentals and uh in my background in in a lot of in a lot of gospel churches uh, a lot of us would lean towards flats more than we would use sharps it just seemed to happen like we never play in f sharp we we're always playing in g flat right <laughs> we're never playing in c sharp we're always playing in d flat right f flat you know that's <laughs> you know that's an exaggeration but uh uh i was curious if uh if the leaning towards flats um, in in your writing process was stemming from the same background, like uh, just used to using flats in in gospel music and in, in gospel writing, um, uh, I, in in your writing process as you're like uh, getting towards like whatever the enharmonic um, endings are. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Well, <laughs> I, I do play a lot of gospel music uh, in the churches that I do play at. Um, you know, I'm playing classical literature as well as gospel repertoire. Uh, maybe it could have been an unconscious thought <laughs> that that was going on. That's interesting. I like that question. Um, well, actually, there was an experiment going on my part because I'm going from a master's in composition. So my instructor um, told me that many times he he's not writing with key signatures. And so this was my first hand at trying to write something without a key signature. And so I said, okay, this is very interesting. <laughs> so what happened is um, when I handed this score over to my assistant, well, he's used to key signatures. So he felt it, you know, landing in, you know, certain keys. And so then he put a key signature to it. So I think that's what disrupted the process of where I was going to go with it. <laughs> but um, so I said, okay, I'm going to leave this alone. I'm going to see how this fares. And um, so I, it, it was an experiment, I guess you could say, um, to, to just 
get a feeling for, you know, how to write like this. But to put a key signature to it is a very interesting effect because, in fact, we were making a correction on one of the newts. Um, I think it was a, it was like near the end of the piece, and we corrected this often in the rehearsal when I came, you know, for the read-through at Thomas Circle. And it was in, let me see, with the Sopranos were initially, I think it was written in E natural going to a B flat uh, in the coda. Yeah, it was a B, a high B natural. But that's not exactly what I had wanted. It was going supposed to go to an E to an A natural. So we, you know, we changed that. And mm-hmm. it was top an A natural. So um we were just looking over this the other night, my assistant and I. And it's interesting because what the um finale did, because I'm using the finale program, it went to a double flat for some reason. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. So of course we changed it, you know, so that it would just go to a regular A flat. But it's just interesting to see what happens when you try to do without a key signature versus adding a key signature to, you know, the score. But um, but it's very interesting that you say that about the gospel music, because I do play a lot of gospel music and it does tend to have a lot of flats. However, when I create <laughs> gospel pieces, I tend to write in simpler keys. You know, I don't know what it is about flat keys, because to me, they're so much more difficult to play in. But a lot of gospel uh, writers tend to, at least a lot of the earlier ones, tend to do a lot of things with flat keys, which I think is really interesting. It's much harder to do. But um, that is a tendency of gospel writers, at least some of the earlier ones as well. Mm-hmm. Well, it, and you, 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 I think you just like Landa right in my second question. I was because uh, I had heard you were uh, you were studying composition. Uh, well, officially now, you know, you've been writing for some time, right? And uh, I was curious as to how how this study of it now was currently impacting. Uh, the writing process, even in this piece, but it sounds like, I mean, you, you were talking about how writing without a key signature in this piece was some of the experiment. Um, would it be headed in a different direction if you hadn't have put the key signature on it? Like, would, would we see a different process or? The uh, only thing that I would see is that you, yeah, you would possibly see maybe a mixture of some things going on when it came to the spelling out, I think, of notes and voicings is what I'm thinking. Um, because when I looked at some things, when I noticed other composers, when they're doing that, sometimes you don't have exactly the same lineup of sharps and flats, you know, as you're going per bar, which I think is really kind of interesting, you know, to see that. And I guess it depends on the composer, you know, as to how exact, you know, they are per measure you know, with those accidentals and whatnot. Um, There was one other facet, um, because I did start off as a composition major at Temple University. And it's so interesting, it's ironic that um, one of the reasons I changed to education, because when they started writing pieces on thirds and intervals, and I kept thinking to myself, I don't want to write music like that. (laughs) And, And so yet, today here I'm writing contemporary music, you know, as well as, you know, things that are um, kind of borrowing from various eras. But a lot a lot of the things that I'm doing are, are very contemporary, you know, in the approach. But, um, but what I'm finding with what I've been learning here in the master's program, um, it's expanded my knowledge of uh, electronic music, um, I've been, you know, I did some things with that, which I've never experimented with before. Um, also, my expansion of, of the use of the orchestra and the forces of an orchestra and of a band. Um, I've written for band, but this was very interesting because um, I ended up writing a um, an adaptation um, of a piece that I did for my daughter for flute and piano and lift every voice and sing. And it's about 37 pieces or, you know, various instruments. And um, so, and then I'm, I know that it's going to definitely affect my writing for orchestras because I had orchestration with a phenomenal teacher who um, went through the various families of instruments 
and talked about the various colors and textures and things that you can do with instruments, um, which I was just totally, you know, flabbergasted with things that I didn't know, you know, as a composer writing for instruments. And so I think it's just been a wonderful journey um, to expand, you know, my mind in that way. And I'm sure it, it, you know, it's already affected, you know, my writing as a composer for choral works as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Welcome. May I ask a related question? Yeah. Your, uh, the piano part is very difficult. <laughs> it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, and uh, I think you and I were talking about that, but uh, after rehearsal, but I'd love to hear there were some moments, especially in the, I think it's the last couple of pages where there's these tents that the left hand has to reach. And I said, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> and w what should Monica, our accompanist do? Uh, and what I, I would love to, if, if you could share your response. Well, the basic harmonies um, usually are your upper harmonies. Um, if there, if things are beyond a stretch, and especially if they're doubled, um, that the upper harmony, since I look at, you know, some of the six um, note to VC that are happening between the right hand and the left hand. And so I figured those kinds of things, if there are any stretch issues, that because basically I said, I think I'm hitting at least about a tenth or so with my hands. And th there's a funny story about that because when I was about 12 or 13 and I was going to a church uh, that the gentleman I was just speaking to had a lot of gospel repertoire, but the pianist, um, all of the pianist and the organist had been classically trained. And what happened is the, the female pianist, her father used to play honky tonk. And so his stretch was amazing. And she had an amazing stretch as well. And so I used to ask them for lessons after church every Sunday. And so as a result, they neither the organist nor the pianist, and the organist was fabulous. He used to practice six, seven hours a day as a classical pianist, which was amazing. Um, so when he did gospel music or his improvisations, they were very classical, Chopin and, and all the various classical composers were fused into his music. And of course he had a marvelous stretch as well. So I would come home every Sunday and I would pick a chord where I could play them with, you know, the left hand and right hand using these stretches, you know, as the female pianist did with this honky tonk voicing. And my hand used to be hurting and I didn't know that I was stretching my hand in the process. <laughs> so this, there's this wide stretch between the what is it? This, is that the index finger, the second finger, and the thumb? There's this wide span that I got over the years after doing that, and I would, as I said, I would, I would come home and just do these chromatic um, renditions of these chords, having no idea that I was stretching my hand like that, you know, through the years. <laughs> so that's that's how this stretch came about. But when it comes to those chords, usually the upper if it's um, if it's beyond the octave, the upper two notes, and especially if, like as I said, if they are the right hand, the upper two notes, and then the left hand would be the bottom two notes, um, would be the more important ones that I would think. Because I'm looking at where you might be talking about. You saying the last two pages? I think. Yeah, and then I had them kind of dropping around on these octaves. But uh, yeah, that, that would probably be the most effective way to, you know, to do that. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, you... But again, in orchestra. So even when, when I'm playing the piano, it's like a, a, an orchestral uh, reduction because I'm thinking, you know, orchestra being bomb bombastic and big. Definitely, especially with those, you employ the bottom octave of the piano a lot in those last two pages. Um, yeah, and the, the chords I'm actually talking about are on page six, 
where when I try to reach them, I can't, but Ms. Carrington in rehearsal showed me her reach. She can just strike those, those tenths. It's really impressive. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that would be, yeah, the outer, the outer upper note, two notes in the right hand, the outer lower notes for the left hand. Yeah, that would be the best way to reach them or to get the essence of the chord. <laughs> It's amazing that that always comes up in my in my pieces where I have piano work. <laughs> How am I supposed to reach those notes? <laughs> oh. And then the other approach sometimes in the left hand is to either break it up or arpeggiate it. That sometimes is a help. If you know if it can fall within the beats. I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm Polly. I'm an alto. I'm just wondering if you have a preference of writing for voices versus piano versus instruments. Well, I tell you, I'm very excited after coming out of this master's program. Um, I think it's taken away some of my trepidation. <laughs> For writing for orchestra and especially for band because band has a lot more transposition uh, going on in, in those instruments. I was a little bit more intimidated for writing for bands. Um, sometimes it can be a little uh, trepidation also playing for the woodwind section and some of the brass, you know, that transpose instruments. Um, and also for percussion. Percussion is a very interesting family to write for. So I'm excited because I have felt that I've been giving more tools to, you know, to write for instruments. So I'm not as fearful, you know, of doing that. Um, of course, where my comfort level is for a singer, because I'm a singer, um, I'm very comfortable with writing for voices because you know, I've had the privilege of um, singing various genres, you know, backup singers and gospel music, jazz. Um, so, you know, I've heard all these various timbres and colors that the voice can get. And so I'm just so much more comfortable with that. Um, and then because I'm a pianist and organist, um, I feel very comfortable, you know, writing for keyboard instruments as well. So those four, I'm, I'm just very comfortable with, but I think that I, I don't feel as fearful <laughs> to begin to start writing more for instruments. Um, I think I'm just very excited about the future of doing more of that as well. Great question. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, this is Ross. Um, I wanted to ask, um, so you mentioned, uh, Miles mentioned that you started playing music at a very young age. Um, at what point did you start composing music? And how do you feel like you're, you're you know, how, how have you progressed as a composer of, over your career writing? How, you know, how does, how are the pieces you're writing now compared to, to earlier pieces? Well, good question too. <laughs> um, the very first per uh, very first piece um, that I composed, but it had not been written until some years later, actually to put the paper, um, was a piece that came to me. I think I was about nine years old, and it was similar to a prelude um, by Chopin, and very um, homophonic, and I should say very safe <laughs> in the way that it was written. And then I began to start arranging for a little small octet of, of female singers in junior high school. And that was about, I think I was about, let me see, coming out of elementary 11, 12, 13. So I must've been about 13. So, um, so I started arranging things like, um, what is it? Born Free, Girl from Ipanema, um, I'm trying to think of who else. Now, mind you, all this time, I wasn't really scoring a lot of things, but just doing things from memory, you know, and teaching it by rote. 
you know, to various groups, you know, that I was working with, because I also was a church musician, you know, playing for churches and things at that time as well. Um, but the arrangements, because I began to hear the music of um, Carlos Job, um, Antonio Carlos Jobim, when I went to a, um, it was a summer course for young people. And I think I was about 12 years old when I went to this camp. And one of the students brought in, you know, Antonio Carlos Jobim, and I fell in love you know, with his music. And so, um, of course, you know, I didn't have a bass player. So, of course, I would, you know, implement that in my basses, in my bass playing. And um, we had like do's and ah's and things in the background. I would have the various, you know, parts going around the melody. And, um, but I had also been introduced to, um, I'm trying to think of the, the gentleman he did. He was a trumpet player that was a, um, that my brother used to listen to. And it was, uh, oh gosh, his, his name is like at the top of my tongue, but I just can't remember the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember it. But anyway, it was songs like Sugar Lips and all these kinds of pieces that were playing. So again, I was listening to Motown and all kinds of wonderful things, you know, at this time in my life. And so I was listening to more combo type work as well as my church work. So when I really started arranging more um, I would say I was coming out of junior high school, going into high school, and then my things began to become more um, elaborate uh, when I began to, you know, do some things for bass, you know, drums and whatnot, but still not really doing a lot of scoring, you know, but teaching people, again, things by rote. And the, the manuscript that I did do was, I, I call it scrawl. <laughs> you know, that I was just kind of doing that kind of thing. And so when I look back at some of that writing and say, oh my gosh, it looks like chicken scratch, but people understood what I was doing. <laughs> I guess that's all that matters. Um, so, and I became a lover of Quincy Jones and a lot of, you know, thick texture writing with his band writing. And I think it was one of his recordings called Walking in Space um, that had these wonderful back background voices coming in and out. And um, and I had the opportunity to do backup singing, you know, so and basically the things that my family was doing, we were singing anthems and spirituals, you know, basic homophonic type pieces. Some things have some fugal material, um, but they were basic um, renditions of, of choral literature, hymns and things, you know, became my favorites and whatnot. Um, but the actual formal piece that I wrote was in, for my high school graduation and it was called new generation when i look back at that, that was in my scrawl again <laughs> but um i had my lyrics my own lyrics and we talked about new generation brand new nation of today the lyrics came to me and i began doing writing some poetry when i was in high school because i had a teacher um a couple of teachers who taught us um shakespeare and things like that and you know pentameter and the various meters of poetry, just fascinated with that type of thing. And that really helped me with my poetry and um, didn't realize that I had that in my, in my being to do poetry. And so it, I, I find it comes alive when I begin to write music, that that poet side of me um, comes out. And I, I write, you know, from inspiration when it comes to that. Um, so when I went on to Temple University, and as I said, you know, I started in composition, and um, but I wasn't really excited about writing on intervals. I wasn't really interested in what some of the composers were doing then, and the electronic music and all of that, because to me, I said, is that music? You know, it just sounds so contrived and so mechanical, so I got out of it, but I was still arranging, you know, for groups and whatnot. And in fact, I had the wonderful experience of um, doing the arrangement for Duke Ellington. And I had a chance of singing with the Duke Ellington band on some of his sacred concerts because a dear friend of mine was working with him as a choral director. Well, that also opened up my mind uh, as far as what a band can do. And if, I don't know if you're familiar with his sacred concerts, but there's some phenomenal writing uh, for the band in those scores. And then also the choral writing, but the band is just off the charts, you know, the way Duke Ellington wrote for them in those sacred concerts. And while at Temple, um, my 
I should say what I learned the most that really has affected a lot of the writing that I do now uh, was our wonderful choral director by the name of Robert Page. And Robert Page uh, was like a Robert Shaw, um, but I don't think he got quite, a, you know, the praise as Robert Shaw and was not, you know, put out there the way um, Robert Shaw was as well. But he took us, our folders would almost fall out of our arms because he had so much repertoire. We were doing things from Gabrielli, always in Ligeti and going through all the various eras. And he's, I, I want you all to be familiar with all the development of music. And I remember he wanted me to do an arrangement of Bridge Over Troubled Water, which I didn't get a chance to do. I was a little nervous about it. But um, in my singing, sometimes I do jazz and um, bluesy type singing and gospel and whatnot. And he heard me do a rendition with piano and vocal on that. But um, but again, but his music, the music that he, you know, that we explored with him, and it, and I and I really negated to say about my elementary school training uh, from various groups that I also was in. We did um, various types of children's literature, um, classical literature that was quite wonderful. Um, junior high school, we're doing Durfle Requiem and things like that. So I was being exposed to all this glorious music. Um, the Schubert, I think the waltzes, uh, I'm trying to think who the waltzes by, um, Liebes, Brahms Liebes Leader. So you'll hear some of the Brahms Liebes Leader as, you, as I mentioned about the, in the quartet section of Bildi the Walls. So what you're hearing in my music is the journey that I had taken from my not only my school years, but those choirs that I was in from elementary school all the way up through high school and into my college years. Because what you hear in the latter part of Build You, Wall, Build you the Walls is some of what I learned when um, I was at Temple with that contemporary and the, and the way I approached the piano, particularly in that latter part um, at the end of the piece. So my music is reflecting my journey, depending on what I'm writing, um, of all this wonderful repertoire that I've heard, you know, through the years as a child, coming up through my college years, even till today, you know, things that I've been hearing. And I think that that has definitely affected my writing. I hope Thank that you. is. Fascinating. <laughs> mm -hmm. Really interesting. Ms. Carrington, this is Deborah. I, um, I think that the trumpet player you might have been referring to was Al Hurt. Is that who it was? Hurt, I'm just thinking back to my own. And I I loved his his trumpet playing, I, his music when I was young. And I I thought, oh, she she said sugar lips. It must be Al Hurt that she's referring to. I hadn't thought about that in a long, long time. <laughs> and and he loved music. And I remember hearing that sugar lips and other pieces that he did as well. You're absolutely right, Al Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing back that memory to me. <laughs> great music, great trumpet player. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think any of these things that I've heard over a period of time, I, I forgot to even mention um, doing backup singing to, um, uh, what's the saxophone player from Philadelphia? Grover Washington. I had the wonderful experience of, of doing some background singing uh, for one of his shows. And um, especially so experienced, you know, uh, the violinist who played along with his group at that particular time, um, his name was John Blake. Um, we used to have a group and I used to play for them. We were in a group together for about three years as I, I was a jazz pianist, you know, with that group. Um, I laugh about that because um, me reading chords was a tedious situation. It still is kind of a tedious situation because you got to flat at this and erase this and, a, you know, all these various names of the various chords. And they were so patient with me learning the various pieces. I'll never forget learning Chicoria's uh, Spain, which was a, quite a nightmare trying to learn it. But once you, when you learn these pieces, you've got it and you go, you know, but, um, but I just look at all of these experiences that they all have become a part of whatever I write, you know, depending, like I said, depending on what the piece is and what the genre that's being required, you know, for my writing.
May I ask, you composed the lyrics to this piece as well. How did you, what's the process? What came first? Did, was there a musical idea that came first and also a general sense of what the, what you thought the text should be about? And then how did you fit the words to the music or vice versa as you went along in this process? Well, um, that's the part that always is amazing to me. Um, and just just to illustrate um, that sometimes, uh, and it rarely happens that a piece will come to me as I'm looking and reading on about other composers, um, of how sometimes they will sit down and structure a piece all the way out to the end. I rarely get a piece that comes to me like that. And I said, how do they do that? <laughs> Um, because I just, my pieces have to kind of grow and become something. It's like making a fine, beautiful dress, you know, that, you know, so, no, I, I think I might want to change that collar. Mm, that sleeve doesn't work, you know, and that to me is kind of the way I tend to write music. And so the first part that came to me, as I, as I mentioned, the, the first pages and the introduction came to me first, you know, um, you know, dealing with the, I long for childhood days gone by, no thoughts of race or creed. And those are the first lyrics that came to me and where love was like a peaceful river flows. Okay. Now it just came to me like in a section like that. And then that accompaniment just kind of came with it and then developed into the arpeggiated figure that happened into the accompaniment. Now, sometimes the harmony, and I'm trying to think the harmony did not quite come to me initially with it's just a melody. And then as I began to work with it, I said, okay, I think this is a more homophonic section here and begin to harmonize along with the line. And so what I'm trying to do, I'm finding is to try to use some of what Shaw and um, Alice Parker used in their writing form. And as I read about Alice Parker, she she would mention how she and Shaw would sit together. And many times she was writing homophonically in, in her approach to something. And he would take a line and extend it, or he would go another direction with a with a rhythm or something and change the texture of where she was going. So I find myself trying to employ that. And I said, I like that. Okay, I said, that gives me a chance to say something different. Uh, against the melody so it's not just strophic you know so that began to open my idea of of kind of writing with that kind of thought in mind the imitation like where it says no evil thoughts and then the alto and then it kind of goes back and forth between the soprano and the alto that triplet figure so that you have these different things going on you have this first you have the accompaniment with the tenor and the bass is just going strong you know strophic more homophonic, but the upper lines are are doing this nice little play back and forth. Then you have that happen later uh, in bars, uh, was it 15, 16, where you have that duet triplets going on between the altos and the tenors. So that, but the, but the, the main idea is to have the soprano just floating atop all of these other things going underneath it, you know? So, um, so that happened in, and it took a little while before that developed, you know, into all of those things going on because um, just a segment of those words came to me. And so sometimes I have to just let it sit for a little while and say, okay, now what else is going to happen? And so I think with this one, some things came to me at the end. Sometimes things will come out of totally out of flow and I'm trying to figure out, okay, how's that going to connect? And so I do the first part and then got to the end and and I could hear that ending, you know, where the, what is it? Within our hearts. Okay, let me find where that is. Yeah, so within our hearts, like if it's on page 20, so that becomes something more contemporary. And that that idea is is kind of happening in that marcato type feeling where you have that um, arpeggiated figure happening in the, and so this is kind of bringing that arpeggiation idea back 
you know, to the ending of the piece. But that's what I always think is so interesting. I said, okay, now that's the ending. Okay, now where's that middle section going to go? <laughs> you know, so I have to kind of live with the piece for a while. And then this out of the blue came to healing is the children's bread. And that came to me as a section where I could actually hear the harmonies. But I just had to figure out where to fit it, you know, in the context of where everything else was going. So sometimes, like in this piece, I had to live with it for a while to figure out where it was going to go. And the fuse I had to live with to figure out, okay, because the main piece that came to me was the walls of the city are all torn down. And it went always to the alto section. And it was stopped. And I wouldn't hear anything. <laughs> okay. So, okay, now where's that going to go? So, but um, it was interesting because I kept trying to figure out, okay, the tenor, I could see where the tenor was and then trying to fit where's the bass going to go. Okay. So, again, all of these things, it took a while to figure out, okay, how am I going to harmonically structure that and where is it going to end up? And as I began to get through the fugue, then I think that's when it came to after the that chances firmest part with the sopranos. Um, I kept hearing that that's what I wanted the sopranos to do, to flute, but it didn't end up until like the latter part. Because I was thinking I was going to bring them in a little earlier with that chances firmest idea. But no, it just wasn't coming to me like that. And so I ended up putting them like near the end of the fugal material. And then we moved on to, I think, build needle walls. And it comes back to that thought. Okay. And build you the walls of the city, build you the walls of the city. And that's when I went to this waltz idea. This, you know, kind of came. So it's it's just interesting the flow of things as as I begin to write things that okay, this is what I think would be supposed to be, and then slowly begin to fit this puzzle together. Um, because as I said, I'm, it doesn't seem like a lot of my pieces fall together where I can just sit down and come up with one. Okay, A, B, C, D. That's what's going to happen because. I, I think also when I'm writing about things that deal with what's going on around me, that affects what I'm going to put on the paper. Um, so that has a lot to do with, you know, my thought processes uh, in that it takes such a while for me to come up with what is going to be the essence of what this piece is going to be about, how it's going to flow. So this came to me in pieces, <laughs> quite a bit of piecing together. And then, of course, we come back to the thought of the beginning section, um, because it's like after all of this has gone on, building the walls, I just want to go back to my childhood. You know, so that's what, you know, kind of brings us back to that A material again, after all of these flowing thoughts in the Marcato and all of that and, and the quartet section of the antiphonal and then going back to the A material. Great. And I think that that makes perfect sense at that moment. It's really, it's like we've arrived at this place and then having that sort of recapitulation, almost mm -hmm. like it's out of form, just makes a lot of sense at that. And then we have the coda, of course, after that. So. Right. Right. Great. Well, we are pretty much out of time. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your answers. It was great to hear from you. And we look forward to continuing to work on your peace and we will also look forward of course to the our premiere on may 20th saturday may 20th at 5 p.m so we look forward to seeing you then same here <laughs> thank, thank you for you having me. thank you for your time really appreciate it